So The Chosen Season 4, Episode 7, this is, I think, my favorite episode of the series so far. The writing in this episode, the way that it's set up, the things that are said in this episode are so interesting, so compelling, and it begins with another very interesting start to the episode, which is the flash forward, and we're going to talk about when this happens, why this happens, and what is going on here. We're also going to talk about a list of the apostles that in The Chosen we know are dead so far. This is a really interesting section. So let's jump in and just get into it. So first things first here, we've got Matthew, of course, coming up this hill is a hooded figure. I'm going to skip forward a bit so we get to the part uh, right where we are introduced to him, basically. He kind of walks up these hills. Now, Dallas mentioned that in tradition, the early Christians hid in a lot of different places um, all over Europe and all over um, the Middle East. I mean, a lot of different locations. They hid up in the mountains like this, hid in caves. There are actually caves in Israel today that you can find early church carvings within the cave walls. This is a super, super interesting thing that we see uh, kind of all over the place. So let's jump into this. Throw up the stick. Who are you? How did you find this place? So here, future Matthew is revealed. This is the oldest that we have seen Matthew so far. I'll tell you what the date is here in a little bit, or the approximate date, because they don't give us one. I think that's very smart. I think if the Chosen gave us less dates and referred to dates less than they actually do, it would actually help with the timeline quite a bit if they just cut out all that stuff. So I love that they didn't give us an exact date for this because it allows it to be a little bit more ambiguous uh, and we don't know the exact date uh, which Matthew completed his gospel. Anyway, we'll get into that in a second, but let's continue on. Matthew. For heaven's sake, why the hood? I can never be too sure. You should have sent word. So we would be prepared. I thought the point was people weren't supposed to find out where she was. Z has people who sneak letters in and out. You know that? Tatiana, who is it? What's happening? An impromptu guest, my lady. So right there, we hear this woman's name. We don't really get much of her, obviously, um, but we do get a small little portion here of uh, of who she is. We don't know where she came from or what her story is. It's not really important, but her name is either Tatiana or Atiana, um, and she is basically a bodyguard and a protector for Mary because Mary is very old here. We're going to talk about that in a second. Ready. <laughs> Ready. I hope this isn't an inconvenient time. Oh, no. <laughs> Still unusually pleasant to look at. <laughs> so this is, of course, a reference back to season two, episode six, where Matthew tells Peter that Mary is unusually pleasant to look at. Uh, this is during the time when she actually relapses, and they're in the city of Jericho, I believe. And uh, and so they're trying to find Mary uh Simon and, and Matthew are, and he tells him that. So that's a kind of a, a throwback to that. But I think this scene also shows us that they don't actually end up together. I know there's a lot of people that have been shipping them. Shipping means that you're making a relationship out of two people that you that you watch on TV or whatever. Um, a lot of people have been shipping them together uh, as they have some sort of relationship uh, since season one, really. Um, and so we're really seeing that kind of come out here um, in this moment that it looks like they never were married or got together or anything like that. And so um, it looks like neither of them have been married or if they were that their spouse has now died off. So we don't really know the situation there just as in real life. We don't know if they married or what's kind of going on there. Um, but it looks like the, the whole relationship aspect did not happen, uh, at least in The Chosen. <laughs> I see your eyesight is starting to go. <laughs> <laughs> she says, I see your eyesight is starting to go because he called her beautiful and she's like, yeah, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting cold. The others will never forgive me if I let you catch your death. <laughs> now, Atiana talks about the others there. She's probably talking about the other apostles uh, as well as the early church that started by this point. Careful, it's very dark. Watch where you step. 
I can't believe you came on this way, Matthew. So we're not told where this is, which I think is another smart decision by the chosen team. I think it's intelligent not to add specifics so that those things can't be criticized. Um, but here, this set that they made is actually not part of their Capernaum set in Texas. It's part of a different studio that they actually had to rent out, and that studio made this whole set uh, and helped them to, to make this scene here. Originally, when we saw this set in the behind the scenes for season four, we were theorizing that this would be um that this would be actually david back in time king david because we knew he was going to be in season four but uh i thought this was going to be maybe en Gedi with david and that was going to be kind of a, a biblical moment there with saul and en Gedi. Uh, but it turns out that obviously it's where mary's hiding out with the danger and at your age uh, our age <laughs> it was important mm -hmm. Mary, I finished it. The book? I couldn't risk sending it by courier. And I wanted you to be the first one to read it. Please. So Matthew just says that he's finished his gospel and that he wants Mary to be the first one to read it, right? Uh, to be able to begin spreading the news through his gospel. Now, we have a couple of different dates. There's kind of an early set of dates and a late set of dates for when we believe that the, the gospel of Matthew could have been completed. It basically spans anywhere from 55 AD all the way to like 80 or 90 AD. It just depends on what you believe or where you're kind of sitting with all of that. Um, it's looking like this scene here <clears throat> most likely is at least 30 years after the death of Jesus. And so if we take 30 AD, this is probably around 60 AD or so. Somewhere in that range, I think is pretty fair to call it. That means that Mary Magdalene, who in The Chosen is older than Jesus, she's about six to eight years older than Jesus. I can't remember the exact math because I don't know if we have her birth date, but the very first scene that we ever see in The Chosen is Mary Magdalene as a child uh, in um, the night that Jesus was born, basically, during uh, the, the star of Bethlehem and everything is happening, okay? So she's already like five or six or seven, somewhere in there during the time that Jesus is born. Um, so let's say that she's six years older than Jesus. That means that she is 39 when he is crucified. And then here she would be 69. So almost 70 years old, basically. So it's very plausible that here, Mary is supposed to be in her late sixties to early seventies um, as a, a very old woman during this time, especially. Um, and hiding in the mountains and stuff probably isn't the greatest for her health as well. But <laughs> here she is finally with Matthew's completed gospel as they're getting ready to kind of push it out here. And I want to hear your thoughts. I have to be here for it. I can't believe it. Oh, you were... I wonder too if it would be in this format or if it would be a scroll. Just something I would think about. I, don't, I have no idea uh, if, if that were the case or not. So hard for so long. This will be a treasure for all time. I'm here to see about that. It will outlive us. We know that much. Very, very true. Remember, this is just the the Gospel of Matthew. This is not the entire Bible, so you can see how big the parchment pages are there. I'm sure Matthew, by this point, has rewritten it several times and come up with a completed final copy. Um, yeah, but interesting stuff. I know I'm right. Over by the fire, you two. We've got to warm you up. Ah, yes. Betty, before we say anything further, I'm afraid I have some bad news. I've gotten used to that. This I could have sent word of, but I thought since I was coming here to see you, I would tell you in person. So by this point, Mary Magdalene is very used to hearing about people's deaths and kind of what's going on. Remember the first time that we saw an older Mary Magdalene, not nearly this old, but uh, an older version about 15 years after, um, 15 years, I guess, between here and the resurrection. So we've seen like kind of a couple different versions here. Um, 15 years after 
Jesus was crucified, basically, we see her meeting with Mother Mary, and she talks a lot about, you know, how the, the boys are doing and, and who has died and who is about to die, basically. Um, and so she's used to bad news coming. She's used to the apostles being hunted down, as they have been for the past 30 years for her. Little James. How did it happen? So little James has died. Um, a lot of people will refer to him in scriptures or, or in tradition as James, the son of Alpheus. Um, and so uh, that's kind of how people will talk about him, which is going to be important for us to understand how he dies here as well. Where? Mary, you know, don't. I want to know. I can handle it. Tell me. Lower Egypt. King Hyrcanus had him run through with a spear. So little James dies in lower Egypt and the king has him run through with a spear. What about Onya and the girls? So here she asks about Onya and the girls. Onya and the girls is referring to little James's family. So it depends on the tradition that you believe. Obviously we have a lot of Catholic people that watch this channel. So you're probably going to say, well, none of them had kids or a lot of them didn't have kids. Right. Um, but I think naturally a lot of us would believe that historically a lot of the apostles would have had wives and kids. In fact, the scripture tells us this much, right? We see later on where Paul talks about how he could bring along a wife with him, but he, but he doesn't, right? Um, but he could as the other apostles do, okay? So actually we know that several of the other apostles, if not all of them, uh, would have had a wife and children and offspring, all that kind of stuff. And so here she talks about Anya and the girls, and these would be um, little James' daughters and his wife. We don't know how many or what, what that is. And again, they keep it vague because I think that's important for the show, not to just claim certain things all the time. Um, but here we see Mary obviously worried for them and how they're going to survive and what they're going to do here. But before we get to that, I want to invite you to go to Israel with us. I know that these videos are great and you're learning a lot through this series, but there is nothing like being there in person and seeing exactly what happens in Israel, what there is, what there is to learn and the people to meet, the food to eat, everything. This next trip that I've planned is the cheapest that I can possibly get these trips. Normally they're five or six or $7,000, but my trip here is less than $4,000. We'd love for you to be a part of it. And if you can at all sign up, there's a link down in the description down below, or you can take your phone's camera and point it at this QR code and it'll take you directly to the site. From there, you can check out our brochure and see exactly what we're doing. And you can even save your spot with a $500 deposit. As you're seeing here, we had some of the most amazing moments in our last trip to Israel, and we'd love for you to be part of the next one. So don't wait, sign up today. Spots are limited as always. And let's get back to the video. Mercifully, they were not there to see it. Oh, thanks be to God. So they weren't there to see little James die. And it's important for us to understand um, this is just one of the theories about little James dying. We don't ever get a biblical moment where little James dies. Uh, I think we get one one or two New Testament moments where we hear about little James and where what he's doing uh, in the ministry of Jesus in the early church. However, we never get a moment of uh, uh, clarity of how he dies or when he dies. I think the only apostle that we get clarity on that is uh, is Big James. Uh, in The Chosen, he's called Big James, right? James the Greater. Um, and so Big James, we know, is the first to be killed, essentially, um, of the apostles. And then, late, well, yeah, because we're not counting Judas, obviously. <laughs> um, and so Big James is kind of the first one out of the apostles to die. And then John is the last one, but we don't really have any strong uh, written, like, hey, for sure, this is it, right, for any of the apostles. And we have all these stories, like Peter was crucified upside down, or some of them were boiled alive, or these different traditions that have gone on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. And so little James, the more conclusive one, the one that is most accepted as tradition actually is not this where he's killed in lower Egypt. It's actually where he was killed uh, at the temple in Jerusalem, where the Jews actually threw him off the precipice of the temple. And then he still didn't die. So then they went down to him, they threw stones at him, and then they smashed out his brains with a, a, a wooden club. Basically that is the more, uh, more accepted tradition for how little James actually died. Still really, really crazy. Um, but I wonder if the chosen didn't want to use that one because 
I don't know, it was too violent or, or something like that. But that is the, the, the theory that I run into most when I do research on Little James' death specifically. These men are moving them to stay with Nympha and her husband at Colossae. So this is another connection we're getting here. Uh, Z's men. So Z obviously commands a group of men. He is the one that's kind of doing all the communication between these different groups, including Mary, as we heard at the beginning of this scene. So Z's men are controlling a lot of things in the early church, and he is a commander of all these different things that are happening. Okay, um, And so he says that they are moving them to Colossae with a couple that is in Colossae. Um, let's go back and listen to that one more time. To God. These men are moving them to stay with Nympha and her husband at Col So Nympha and her husband at Colossae. And of course, Colossae is the church that Paul writes letters to, which we're about to hear from them. And this is the book of Colossians. Colossae. Paul's been sending letters to the church there. They should be safe there. I'll send a letter to Onya. What would you say to her? He's not suffering anymore. So this is a pretty big thing. We're going to talk about this in a different video for this episode specifically, but little James is obviously suffering. He's been suffering. This is not a biblical thing. We don't know in scripture if any of the apostles had any certain maladies or uh, infirmities or anything else. Um, but in the chosen specifically, he has some form of cerebral palsy or a limp or something that has been, that he's been affected with pretty much his whole life. Right. In this season in particular, it shows that it gets worse and worse and worse. And in episode seven, we're seeing a lot of that, which we'll talk about in another section. But here, Mary has a very you know close moment with him, uh, knowing that he was in pain his whole entire life. And it's something that he had to deal with. It was a burden that God gave him to live with for the rest of his life. And so she's going to write to his wife, Onya, and say that he's not suffering anymore. He was in pain his entire life. And he so rarely complained. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Athena. Delicious. I'm going to stay up all night and read your manuscript. I want to relive it all. Even the hard parts. Is something wrong? That is why you came, isn't it? No, it is. Uh, it's just uh, something I, I noticed. My dance? I write letters there. I apologize. I don't mean to pry. I just noticed as I passed by those scraps don't look like letters. You read them? No. No, 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 Mary, I would never. I just... The pieces sitting there struck me as... odd. Matthew, let me read your volume. Don't busy yourself with my scribblings. I now, we'll talk about this real quick. Um, obviously, in The Chosen, Mary was taught by her father and by her family how to read and write growing up. And so she has a skill that a lot of women would not have during this day. We don't actually know if this was true for Mary Magdalene, uh, if she could write or read or anything. Uh, for example, Tamar does not know how to read <laughs> in The Chosen. And so there's a lot of things here that we're not really sure um, are even plausible. Um, but here she's writing um, her own psalms, essentially, uh, is where uh, this kind of goes. I'm sure they're more substantial than scribblings. Why are we talking about this? Parchment is expensive. You live in a cave on the mountainside far from merchants or civilization. No one in your position or mine wastes paper. It's true. I'm not wasteful. Mary, I value your thoughts. And I am eager to hear them all. Will you allow me? <laughs> Atiana seems like a really interesting character, um, and uh, she's kind of like poking Mary to be like, just show him, <laughs> like, just show him the stuff. Like, come on. It's 
I see like almost like a, a Paul Timothy type of relationship with them. Fine. You know I'm here for you. Now and always. She looks back again. Approval for Atiana. I've been having dreams lately. About some of the darker times in my life and his and others among us. I wanted to write them down so I don't forget. I'm trying to assemble them into something. So this is where I started to get worried when I was watching in theaters, when she says I was starting to assemble them into something because there is a Gnostic gospel of Mary. Uh, this, so to give you a, a complete understanding or not a complete understanding, but a foundational understanding there after the time of Jesus, right? There are the, the actual gospels that are taken in place from eyewitness accounts or people that were there during the time of Jesus's ministry. For example, Matthew, right? And John, these are two that are written from the apostles that follow Jesus. Then we have Mark and Luke who are written by people that take eyewitness accounts from people that follow Jesus. And they were part of the early church and the early ministry of the apostles, etc. Right. And so we see these two, these four gospels that are obviously the clear gospels gospels that we have, um, you know, throughout all of it, but the gospel of Mary and the gospel of Nicodemus, the gospel of Thomas, all these different things started to appear several hundred years after the regular, the actual gospels were written. Okay. So 700 years later, these Gnostic gospels started to pop up all over the place that became very unreliable and, um, unrealistic to be credible in any way. Okay, so the Gospel of Mary, I, right here, I was like, oh gosh, people are going to start to ask questions about this. They're going to get confused about this. They're going to think that Mary Magdalene wrote her own gospel, right? So to be clear, Mary Magdalene did not write anything that we know of in history, period, right, about Jesus or about anything. We don't know anything that she wrote. Um, but this Gospel of Mary has been proven to be basically false. It has nothing to do with Mary Magdalene. It was written way later, and in it are a lot of Gnostic ideas that basically shot that they, they show things that are not of the true gospel. They are another gospel as Paul would say. Okay. So these are things that are completely different than, um, than what we'd see in the actual scripture in the actual canon in the actual Bible. Um, so no, this is not a real thing, but sure. If Mary knew how to write and read, it is possible that she could have written something down, uh, as like a, a poem or a Psalm, right. For herself. Now there is a, a really good line in this. I know that the chosen wasn't trying to lean towards the gospel of Mary at all. Just wanted to clarify that there's a really good line here where she shares what this is for. So let's get to that. I don't know. Just, just for me, no one else. So that line there is really, really important. It's just for me, no one else. This is not a gospel that she's trying to assemble. This is not something that she's trying to do and push on to, you know, the gospels or the early church or whatever else. It's just for her, no one else. Understand. I'm sorry to have pride. I would only want you to share if you felt comfortable sharing. Hmm? Perhaps I can share them with you. My oldest friend. Now, this is a curious line as well. This is the last line of this whole scene right here, and then we're going to jump to the end of the episode. But this kind of shows us a couple of different things. The fact that she says, maybe I can share it with you, my oldest friend, um, is really, really telling as to where we are in the timeline and who has died already. Because remember, she first met Jesus, then she met for example, Barnaby, Shula. Um, then we have uh, Thaddeus and little James, right? We know that little James has died. We also know several other people that have died within this uh, within this timeline of the chosen so far. So let me read you out a list. So, so far, we know for a fact that obviously Jesus has died, uh, uh, resurrected and ascended. Uh, we know that big James has died. We know that Nathaniel has died because, of, uh, because Mary actually talks about him during the Christmas special. We know that Thaddeus has died, 
because this Matthew would not be her oldest friend if Thaddeus was still around. We know that Andrew has died in Greece, again, from the Christmas special. We know that little James has died from this scene right here. We know also that Judas has died. So, so far, those are the ones that we know have died from the apostles. It's possible by this point that Peter has probably died. Um, Simon the Zealot, we know, is still alive because he's operating and doing different things. We know that John is still alive because he's doing a bunch of different things. Um, but in The Chosen specifically, Mary met Matthew around the same time that she met Peter and James and John and all of them, and she was the closest with Matthew by far from the very beginning. So other than Thaddeus and uh and little James and, and people like that, she met Matthew pretty early on in the whole journey. So to call him her oldest friend means that all these other people have passed on now too. So there's a lot of people that are actually dead by this point. And remember, this is 30 plus years after the resurrection. So yeah, there's a lot of time there for people to have died and be hunted down and all that different stuff. We do know that Paul is still alive at this point as well, which gives us a good, good timeline for it as well. But anyway, yeah. Yep, that's the end of that section there. We get into the intro. Then I'm going to jump to the end of the episode, and I want to talk about uh, this ending scene here. Let me go back a little bit. Here we go. Right, one of my own. Let me back it up. The more I read the songs of David, the more I felt the need to write one of my own. So the more I read the Psalms of David, the more I felt the need to write one of my own. Please just know that whatever this is going to be, it's not finished. So rarely let people into your mind. The times you did, I was always grateful. This is an interesting uh, thought process as well. You so rarely let other people into your mind. The times that you did, I was I was grateful. So this is very true with Mary uh, throughout all of it. Whenever she is uh, kind of relapsing back into her alcoholism and everything else in season two, then she doesn't talk to anybody. She just leaves, right? That's the type of person that she is. Even in, even in episode um, six of this season, she's understanding what Jesus is going through. And she, out of anybody, is kind of the most aware of Jesus you know, going to his death. Uh, and yet she's not really having conversations with that about that with everybody. Right. She's not really like warning everybody like, Hey, I think he's really talking about this guy. It's like, you know, she's kind of keeping it to herself. She's not really sharing it. Darkness is not the absence of light. That would be too simple. It's more uncontrollable and sinister. Not a place, but a void. I do wonder at this point, again, I'm thinking about timeline. I'm thinking about what Mary would be aware of. Would she be aware of the gospel of John? Because the gospel of John talks about light so much all throughout it. Obviously in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Um, and he was a light, right? And so throughout all the gospel of John, he talks about light and day and night and darkness, right? So I wonder if Mary would have taken parts of that to write this. Um, yeah. Interesting stuff. I was there once. More than once. And although I could not see or hear you, you were there. Now, she's talking about Jesus here, obviously. I'm going to pause it uh, quite quite often through this section because there's a lot of music. I want to be careful about that with copyright and all that kind of stuff. YouTube is always a little bit strange with that, so. Waiting. Because the darkness is not dark to you. So this is really cool. I love these little vignettes uh, that are being shared even past the dialogue that Mary is sharing. We're seeing the past or the present during the chosen show. And we're seeing these little vignettes of what is going on for everybody here. First, we see Lazarus. He is looking at his grave clothes. Obviously, he's just been resurrected. A lot of people hate when I use that word resurrected. Lazarus is raised from death. Uh, resurrected is the word for that. So in English, it just makes sense. I know a lot of you have, are very picky about 
about how I say Lazarus was raised from the dead or if he was resurrected. Resurrected is just the word that means from death to life. So he was resurrected. <laughs> I'm just going to keep on saying that. So uh, Lazarus was resurrected. So he has these clothes in front of him. I'm sure this is like a moment of unbelief, a moment of what just happened, uh, kind of getting into that there. At least... It's not I love this look too from Demetrius Troy. Just perfect moment here with the, the tears in his eyes as well. Now here we see Yusuf. I know some of these scenes are dark. You're probably like wondering what's happening here. This is Yusuf and he is in Jerusalem and his father Arnon is coming to wake him up and to tell him what happened uh, with Lazarus and Jesus. You wept. Not because your friend was dead. But because soon you would be. So that's a really powerful line. You wept, not because your friend was dead. You knew that you were going to raise him. You knew that he would come back to life. But because you soon would be. Lazarus, the reason why this episode is called The Last Sign is because Lazarus is the last like the last big miracle that happens here going into Jesus's death. It is the thing that triggers all of the Sadducees and the leaders of the religious people to want to kill Jesus and to kill Lazarus. So there's a plot that we're going to look at in, in John chapter 11 uh, and into John chapter 12, where they tr there's a plot that, that they want to kill Jesus because of what happened with Lazarus. Before that point, they were trying to stone him. They were trying to arrest him, but they weren't like plotting to actually kill him until Lazarus was raised because this just broke all of their minds, especially the Sadducees. Because remember, like we talked about previously, the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. So for this to happen and for hundreds of people to be talking about it and being, and seeing Lazarus, knowing that he was dead for four days and then seeing him raised to life, this was something that just completely broke their systems of everything of how it worked. Um, and so uh, this is the last straw here. So Jesus wasn't crying because his friend was dead, but rather that things were coming, right? That he was about to die, that he was about to be separated from his father, that all these different things were going to happen, right? Um, my God, my God, why would you forsake me, right? Why have you forsaken me? This, all this stuff is coming up, right? Everything is coming up. And just as we see in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus did not want to go through with this in his own will, in his human will, right? But he decides to pray, not my will, but your will be done, right? Uh, really, really interesting stuff there. And because we couldn't understand it. Now here is a random Pharisee. Uh, I'm not sure if we know who this is, but he knocks on Shmuel's door. So that all the religious leaders are being woken up. I didn't want to. Or both. So there's Shmuel there. The coming darkness was too deep for us to grasp. So the coming darkness was too deep for us to grasp is what Mary says there. And obviously she's, she's just talking about how they couldn't understand. They did not understand what was upcoming with Jesus. Uh, even scripture sa says that they could not understand. They were kept from understanding. Okay. Now here in the video, in this little vignette here, we're seeing someone wake up Shammai. We had heard previously in episode six that Shammai was out of town for Hanukkah. So he must have just gotten back to Jerusalem and they're waking him up to talk about what happened with Jesus here as well. Shammai obviously being a super, super strict, um, you know, Pharisee. And so obviously this is going to have consequences for Jesus and, and, and what's going to be happening there. But then so is the light. One had to come before the other. It was always that way with you. It still is. Now here we see, earlier in the episode, we saw as Mary was given a key from their family lawyer, basically. <clears throat> After Lazarus had died, all of the money goes to Mary and Martha. So Martha has this key to the, the family money, essentially. Uh, and she goes and she grabs that money. If you can't tell what this is alluding to for a future episode, I'm sorry to say you have to go and read your Bible a bit more <laughs> because this is extremely obvious here uh, what she's doing. So she grabs a whole bunch of money here. And technically it is her money since Lazarus 
passed away, right? It did get transferred to her. So I guess she is the wealthy one now and Lazarus is alive and figuring things out with his business and all of that. So I'm sure that's a lot of paperwork and annoying things. <laughs> Being dead for four days cannot be good for your business. <laughs> Tears fell from your eyes, and then ours. So we see everybody, we're going to see this motif kind of continue as everybody blows out uh, the candles here. I think this is kind of reminiscent of the Chosen itself becoming darker and darker and darker throughout this season. Before every light in the world went out, and time itself went to die with you. Again, Mary is talking about this darkness that's kind of overcoming and everything is becoming more and more dark. But again, Mary reminds us about what this is for, uh, where this is coming from uh, and where this is going to. Again, the darkness of what they're going through. Uh, Big James's injury here, as we see Peter helping him with that. Go back to that place sometimes. Or rather, it comes back to me uninvited. Then we see the darkness of big uh, little James being hurt, being hurt here, and what he's going through. The night that was eternal. He's just in a lot of pain there. Until it wasn't. So that line from Mary as well. We're trying to look and listen to both things at the same time. Um, the night that was eternal until it wasn't. So she's talking about the darkness that just got ever more dark and dark and dark as people died, as Jesus died. And then it wasn't dark anymore when he's resurrected. The hope just blows out the darkness and everything that could have been dark is now beautifully white and light. Um, Christ offers us that hope, right? Which is what we're going to see later on in The Chosen. But for the next few seasons, this is going to be really, really dark. It's going to be really, really hard to walk through. Bitter. And then sweet. But somehow the bitter remained in the sweet and has never gone away. So here we see Thomas with his sundial. Remember, this is the same sundial that he gave to Rama. I want you to keep this in mind for the last episode as well. Uh, as we're going to we're going to see this again. So uh, Thomas has the sundial that he gave to Rama. This obviously signifies Rama herself uh, in a lot of ways as he was never meant to get this back. She was meant to keep it forever, essentially. And this also signifies time as well. The time that they're in right now. It's a very dark time. The time that's going to come, which will be a very hopeful time, uh, but they're not there yet. You told us it would be like that. Not with your words, but with how you lived. The man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Now we'll get into this in another section as well, but there she is quoting um, uh, Isaiah, I think it is. Um, and so, yeah, right here. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one uh, from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So remember this whole section here, uh, this is what she's talking about there uh, as she's kind of reading through. That grief wasn't what we wanted to see. So we see John here blowing out another candle and he's looking at Thomas trying to figure out what to do about his pain as well. So we tried to look away and in so doing fulfilled your very essence. One from whom people hide their faces. Again, a reference to Isaiah 53 there. We see Simon Z blowing out this candle. I really, really love this music here too. Uh, really, really great job on all this music. Very eerie and kind of like, uh, it just brings us to that moment of, of almost like that, um, uh, the dark valley, right? Like that moment of uh, the valley of the shadow of death and like, yeah, just that moment of um, despair. Uh, that's where we're in right now in The Chosen. Like things are just getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and they don't understand why. We see Tamar in the background kind of doing her hair for bed. We see Mary coming forward and she's going to look out the window here. Again, she's blowing out a candle. But soon, we couldn't hide from it any more than we could stop the sun from setting. 
So Jesus is picking up these pottery pieces. These are from Thomas earlier when he was raging out in the courtyard. What I see. And then we see as Jesus is putting these pieces back together. This to me is so, so symbolic of who Jesus is and who God is. The fact that we break all these things in the world and his job is just to make something beautiful out of these broken pieces. Um, I love this moment here as he's like thinking about how he can put these back together, you know, uh, just so indicative of the character of God and, and what he does with our mess, right? <laughs> uh, he just helps us so much to, to put it into perspective and to bring it to where it's supposed to be. remember you wishing there could be another way again she's referencing the garden of gethsemane there i remember you wishing there could be another way uh lord if it's your will please take this cup from me but your will be done right um and so that's what she's referencing there and looking back i do too I still don't know why it has to be this way. The bitter, often mingled with the sweet. Obviously the tomb, this is Lazarus's tomb, but obviously leaning towards the foreshadowing of Christ's tomb as well. Maybe I never will. At least, not this side of and that's the end there. Um, she says, at least not this side of, and of course she means of heaven. Christ does the same thing. Jesus does the same thing earlier in this episode uh, where he's talking with Lazarus. And we'll talk about that in another video as well. So when he's talking with Lazarus, he says this side of, and then it's just meant to be completed by the audience, completed by the hearer there. Um, so really, really interesting stuff. I love this flash forward. There's so many little tiny Easter eggs, uh, and I'm sure there's more that I missed in the cave in some different areas there. Um, really, really cool stuff. I love how they did that. I love, like I said earlier, that they don't, they didn't give us an exact date or an exact location. I think that's very smart, uh, and I think they might have should have leaned into that a little bit more throughout the rest of the chosen earlier on. I think it would have made it more cohesive over time uh, and allowed us to kind of give them grace and, and, you know, shunt in these different moments of time in between the timeline. But anyway, really, really good uh, section there. I love these, these future moments, these flash forwards. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Absolutely.